people, lazy and evil For years I've watched y'all allow Donald Trump turn you to crazy people Where's that freedom ego when you Welcome to Three Count Commentaries Let us discuss AEW Dynamite from November the 3rd, 2021 But first we have to discuss John Moxley um, Placing himself in rehab for an alcohol addiction uh, Kudos to him for realizing that he had a problem For being smart enough and responsible enough to realize that he had a problem, that he had an issue, and that he wanted to get help. It's a thing where nobody knows how long he probably had this issue. He's been in AEW for almost three years, almost the entire length of the company's existence. And he only works one day a week. So it would have been very easy for him to hide having problems with alcohol. I mean, I'm glad he realized he had a problem before he ended up like Hawk from the uh, Road Warriors or before he ended up like Jake Roberts or Scott Hall. And he got to the point where it's completely undeniable that he had an issue. I'm glad he caught himself before he got to that point. That, to me, is a sign of at least being aware of how dangerous the situation that you were putting yourself in. Is when you realize, man, I need to go to rehab. And you really, it wasn't that anybody else forced you to do it. It was, you know, when A.D. Guerrero was showing up to work drunk and the WWE fired him. You know, that was kind of, uh, that was more than a nudge towards rehab. That was, we don't want anything to do with you. Your friends even ratted you out in that situation. You know, you, you got to go get it together. And we can't work with you until you get it together. Same thing with Hawk. Same thing with Scott Hall. We just can't work with you. You have a problem. Because he is not in that environment, and AEW is a completely different environment, it would have been easy for him to continue drinking and working, doing death matches, and getting drunk afterwards, you know, to kill and numb the pain. Would have been easy for him to do that. So for him to catch himself and say, you know what, I got to let this stuff go. That is a real boss man move. Um, kudos to him for that. Um, I would say, I hope he stops doing the deathmatch wrestling. There's a hundred different reasons why you shouldn't do it outside of it just being garbage. But I think that it doesn't help for you to have addictions to painkillers or alcohol or whatever. And to continue doing that kind of mutilation to your body. Because for starters, it's not good for your long-term career to continue doing death matches. Also, it puts it stresses Renee out because every time he does one of these violent death matches, somebody's there to stick a camera in her face or a microphone in her face to ask her, how do you feel about John doing these death matches? And she's just kind of like, he's doing what he loves. And then he comes home drunk or whatever the case may be because he has to numb the pain somehow. These things hurt. He's a real human being. It may look fun. It may look cool. But gigging and losing blood, falling on thumbtacks and glass, that stuff is not fun. So hopefully he smartens up and changes his style, as well as kicks the alcohol. He's a man in his mid-30s. He's got a beautiful family, a brand new daughter. Why risk it? Continuously doing death matches. Kick the alcohol, kick the death matches too. Because I'm pretty sure those two things are related. So that's my, you know... My my uh, thoughts on John Moxley. Um, he's a good dude, you know. As far as again being responsible to his family, being responsible to himself, can't say anything negative about him in that regard. This is going to be something that he has to deal with for the rest of his life, and um, this is going something that wrestling fans know about, and uh, wrestling fans will continue to discuss. But I'm glad. Again, I'm very very glad. He didn't get to the point of Scott Hall or Jake Snake Roberts, and he was smart enough to get out of this situation right now. Okay, so now let's get into Dynamite, which I wish I was smart enough to get out of early. Um, as, as I told everybody, I work long hours, so I had to rush home after, oh, after my shift from 7 to 7, no, from 7 to 7.30 actually, to see Dynamite, and... I regretted it. I, reg <laughs> I regretted it. I regretted the rush. I really did. 
Uh, <laughs> you, th- I, I really only regret rushing home on Mondays and Wednesdays, man. <laughs> on Mondays and Wednesdays, I'd be like, man, I need to take my time. You know, <laughs> let me take my time. But um, let's see. Kenny Omega versus Allen Five Angels. A guy I forgot even existed. And Kenny Omega took like, what, 10 minutes to beat this guy? Why is Kenny Omega wrestling full-length matches against job guys? Why is job guys countering the world champion's finish? <sighs> Kenny Omega wins with the V-Trigger, the running V-Trigger. After the match, Omega thanked him for embarrassing him and ruining his career. And he was going to give him, hit him with a chair. Uh, Michael Nakazawa was going to give him the chair. Handman Page saved Allen Five Angels from Omega. Omega bailed out, leaving the title behind. Omega said, you know, he's going to give him the title back and tell him he got 10 days um, before he loses the belt. And you know what, man? Kenny Omega has been a, what we can call a lame duck world champion. He has been a guy who has just been holding the belt until it was time to lose it for the last several months now. And um, he hasn't done anything. He hasn't been any involved in any real, you know, meaty feuds since he won the title, if we're being honest. The feud with Moxley had some real meat to it. But everything after that was nothing. You know, the Pac thing, Orange Cassidy stuff, none of that stuff was interesting. The Christian stuff wasn't all that either. And he's been champion for a long, long time. It's been a good eight to ten months, right? And he's been champion all this time. And most of his matches have been eight-man tags with the Elite or ten-man tags with the Elite or six-man tags with the Elite. And he has felt like a back-burner world champion for the last several months. As much as I don't believe Hangman Page should be the guy who wins the title from Kenny Omega, I just want the belt off of Kenny Omega. You know, uh, he has been an absolute lame champion for a long time. And I, I don't know when the last time I saw like a real lame duck champion like this. I think it might have been Bradshaw, who was just kind of like champion, but not really. You know, <laughs> it was kind of like the last days of Bradshaw, where he was just getting dicked around all the time. Even Jinder Mahal still had a little bit of a spark to him before he dropped the belt. You know, same thing with Kofi. But when your title run dies in the middle of the run and you're just not doing anything, you're just coasting, holding the belt until you, you dropped it to somebody else, it just seems like that's the weakest title run that you could possibly have. It's one thing to be champion for two days and lose it, but still have a lot of momentum behind you after you lose it. For one thing, it's another thing I should say. When people when you lose the belt and people are like, finally, for fuck's sake, you know, we, we we knew it was coming. We knew it was eventual. And I think that's where we're at with Kenny Omega. There's no excitement around Omega losing as far as I'm concerned. It's just people understand that Kenny Omega is a lame champion. He hasn't really elevated the belt much like Jericho had or Moxley had. Omega has more maintained the belts than anything. He hasn't really elevated it or taken it to the next level. So we're stuck with this. He's not even the most over guy on the roster. You know, he's probably the fifth most over guy on the roster, probably the seventh. If you listen to Kenny Omega's crowd reactions and compare it to Jungle Boy, there's no comp- there's no competition. Compared to Darby, there's no competition. You don't even get to the point of comparing him to CM Punk or Brian Danielson. He's not even more over than some of the young guys on the roster. That's how much of a lame duck champion Kenny Omega has been. It's been awful. And by God, it needs to end. And I don't care who wins it. He could have lost it to this Allen Five Angels guy, and I wouldn't have given a shit. Right? At some point, you got to be smart enough to bail on this thing. And AEW's booking strategy is to try to make everything long term. And in doing so, you run out of gas. And they ran out of gas on Kenny Omega a long time ago. I think after the, the exploding death match, they really didn't have any other, they didn't have a backup plan. You know, they thought that the whole impact thing was going to carry it. Not quite. Not quite. So, after this, Malachi Black cut a promo. He said that the people in power think their decisions represent more than their own self-interest. But banning me from ringside for this match won't change the outcome. You see, when Caesar was assassinated, it wasn't just Marcus that betrayed him. 
And I was like, oh, that's very interesting. Who is going to portray Cody? So then we go, let's let's get into that. Andrade El Idolo, look at me, Cody. Look at me, you little bitch. Look at me, little bitch. Uh, <laughs> Andrade defeated Cody in a match that was very disappointing. Looking at the talent of the guys involved, this match should have been better than it was. Um, I'm not contractually obligated to like everything AEW, so I'm not going to act like this was the best match these two guys could have ever had. I definitely expected a better match from these two guys, and this should have been the main event of the show. But then I see why it wasn't, because the match was kind of flat. You know, the crowd just shit on it. <laughs> they hate everything Cody. And they don't, it's not, uh, it's Cody is not John Cena. Like, people were hot in their dislike of John Cena. They were boiling in their dislike of John Cena. Cody couldn't pull off a one night stand type of situation like John Cena could. People boo Cody to the point where booing is the only kind of a reaction that he gets. And everything else is just muted, flat. Just boo. 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 They don't even really cheer his opponent, they just boo Cody. You know, and it's like, it's the shits. So, uh, FTR popped up, hit Cody with the AAA belt, um, Hammerlock, DDT, Andrade Ali Dolo. Look at me. I made Cody my little beach. And um, so, um, Andrade's loose relationship with the uh, Pinnacle continues, which I, I, I get that. I can understand that. I I rock with that. I can I can dig Andrade in the pinnacle. All right, cool. What does that have to do with Malachi Black? What does that have to do with him? He is a dark occultish character. The pinnacle is a sort of offshoot of the Four Horsemen. What does Malachi Black have to do with this? I don't I don't get it. Make that make sense. That connection needs to be made. Uh, there was. A moment in time for Code for Tully and um, Arn for them to look at each other, and I thought Arn was going to be the one that's going to turn on Cody. It would have made perfect sense for Arn to be the guy that turned on Cody, but they didn't do it. They teased it, but they didn't do it. I don't understand what they're waiting for. Um, personally, I think Andrade and Cody should have been a bigger match, usually a pay per view match. And but seeing if this is the best they can do, I don't. I see why it was in the middle of the show, <laughs> a random Wednesday, because it was nothing really. So um, Lucha Brothers came out there to help Cody as he got beat up. Um, the FTR and Andrade Bail. Okay, so I'm okay with Andrade teaming up with the Pinnacle. I like that idea. I think Andrade needs to have a crew with him, um, a crew of tough guys like FTR works. Um, so I'm okay with that. This is the third partnership between the two. And I don't understand why he just can't join the group. You know, like, why doesn't he just join the group? Just join the pinnacle, man. Why are you, why are you paying for them to help you repeatedly when you should just join the group? And, um, in connection with this, FTR wrestled earlier in the night against Samurai del Sol. And Aerostar for the AAA tag team titles. And we were promised AAA's best tag team or something like that. Or a great AAA tag team. And we got Samurai Del Sol and Aerostar. Look, man. <laughs> Kalisto and Aerostar. I'm familiar with Aerostar. I watch Aerostar and Lucha Underground. I watch AAA. I know who Aerostar is. He is crazy. Like, people see um, his botches, like the AEW botches account, <laughs> saw Aerostar almost falling on his head. They don't know. Aerostar will jump from the rafters and land on his head. He doesn't give a shit. The guy, want, the guy probably, he's like the Misawa of Mexico. He wants to die, okay? He doesn't give it. If he dies in a stunt, he's a legend. And he knows it. So he's going to go for it every single time. <laughs> he's going to go for it every single time. But um, Samurai Del Sol is Kalisto, for people who didn't know. I'm pretty sure if you watched this, you probably did know. Uh, I don't see... I, I don't think I've ever seen him in AAA. But then again, I didn't watch the last couple of shows. I don't watch AAA weekly shows. I watch the big events like, um, you know, uh, Triple Mania. 
um, you know, Ray de Reyes, you know, stuff like that. But um, I haven't seen him there. But I wouldn't be surprised if he's a big if he's a if he's there now. Um, I expected, and I think most of us expected um, El Hijo de Fe Kingo, and maybe somebody else, you know, Black you know, Torus or something like that. Um, am I surprised they didn't get that that level of talent? No, because I'm pretty sure Conan would more likely want a guy like Laredo Kid and uh, LV Kingo to wrestle them in AAA. Um, not like he has much control anyway, but you know, just saying, if he has any say in what goes on with the AAA tag team titles that he runs, because he runs AAA, I would imagine he wants you know the Kingo and uh, Laredo Kid, those level of guys to wrestle FTR in Mexico and not on American television, which is of course the reason why it was stupid to give FTR the tag team titles in the first place. And now you're not sure you can have them wrestle various luchadors, but they're all going to be bullshit luchadors that Conan doesn't care if these guys lose, you know, it's like when uh, Moxley was the United States champion for New Japan. He's like, oh yeah, he can go in there and beat Kenta and Yuji Nagata and the bread guy, um, Satoshi Kojima. But, oh, he wants to wrestle Tanahashi? Oh, he got to wrestle Tanahashi on our show. Oh, he's not going to get to wrestle him on our show? Then I guess we're just not going to do it. Give the belt to Lance Archer. You know? That's the thing about these partnerships. Guy's going to have to have some kind of stroke. You know? So, FTR, of course they win. Why would they lose to fucking Kalisto and Aerostar? Uh, CM Punk kind of promo. Uh, he spent a couple of minutes talking about, you know, Moxley. Before he started talking about Eddie Kingston. Then he said he's still embarrassed for Eddie Kingston. And that if he got any balls, he'll meet him in St. Louis. Where he'll be there to accept Eddie Kingston's apology. Then he said that he was willing to step into the spot open, left open by John Moxley. But he still has these issues with Kingston. So if you're upset that he didn't fill the spot, blame Eddie Kingston. And I was under, and I just wrote down why. Is, is Eddie Kingston the booker? No. So then why am I blaming Eddie Kingston? He's not the booker. He's not the decision maker. The reason why CM Punk is not in the tournament is because CM Punk wasn't going to win the tournament. Therefore, they didn't want to put him in it. Which is... Right, you could have even said, you know, hey, I wasn't originally meant to be in the tournament. They drew names out of a hat. My name was in the hat, but you know, somebody else got picked. It was real unfortunate, but you know, I was in the running for for a little while there, or just not mention it, not mention that you were even an option. You know, find some rinky dink way for you not to be in it. But blaming Eddie Kingston, it's like for what? Oh, you got into an argument with Eddie Kingston. Now all of a sudden you don't want to be world champion. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense, CM Punk. That doesn't make sense, Phil. That's stupid. Come on, man. You got to do better than that. And you know this. This is what's so frustrating about this guy, man. He knows that that shit would not fly under normal circumstances. You guys aren't going to get to see CM Punk versus Orange Cassidy because of Eddie Kingston. Like, because he interrupted you in a promo? That's all it took? Come on, man. You should interrupt your ass all the time, then. Maybe you'll go away. Uh, so, who did get the spot? Miro got the spot. Um, Miro cut a promo. Said that he cursed God. He warned God and threatened God. And now, out of nowhere, he's getting this title shot. And then he says that, is God trying to help him or is God toying with him? Is he, when he looks up in anger, is God looking down in fear? And he says that in this tournament, God, it is you who have to prove yourself to me as I have to prove myself to her. And he said that he must be feared. Then he can be loved. Um, Super Sent Miro is really, is really good. This, this character is awesome. It is, it is such, but it's such a weird position to put yourself in where his character is far more um (laughs) concerned with being embarrassed to his wife than being smited by his god like he cares more about his wife than he cares about god you know he cares more about what his wife thinks than what god thinks which isn't very godly 
You know, especially if he's a, if this guy's supposed to be at least a Christian god or at least a Western god of any kind. You know, putting mortal vagina over the god doesn't seem to make much sense. But hey, it's a it's a character, man. And at least the guy is trying something. At least he's really good at his delivery. At least he's consistent. It's been pretty good. Let's skip to the um, his match with Orange Cassidy, which I wish I hadn't sat, sat and watched. Uh, Miro wins, which was a good thing. Um, Danielson came out for commentary. They did a dive with Orange Cassidy diving off the top rope, and they both landed through a table. Orange Cassidy got back into the ring. They got a nine count on Miro. Miro ended up winning the match by submission with whatever the finish he's calling it now. And the show went off the air with Danielson and Miro staring at each other um, because that is the final for full gear. Um, Miro wins one match and is in the finals. So, that's not bad. Not too bad. He's a fill-in opponent. So, uh, Miro versus uh, Danielson is good money. That's good money. Hope I know the match will be very good. Miro can rise to the level of his opponent. He had a really good match with AJ Styles. He can he can be a killer. I really want him and Danielson to tear it up. I would love that. That would be awesome. All right, see what else we got here. Uh, let's see. Cole and the Young Bucks. Oh, my God. Oh, my. Oh, sweet summer child. Jesus H. Christ. The Young Bucks cut a promo with Adam Cole. Adam Cole talked about last week was a fluke. Then the Young Bucks said that they're tough guys and they're afraid of no one. Christian showed up. They told Christian, oh, yeah, we get, we got you out number three to one. You better back down. Then Luchasaurus showed up and they bitched up and tried to run away. Then Christian and Luchasaurus con- treated the Young Bucks and Adam Cole like bowling pins for the next six minutes, knocking them down over and over and over again, choke slamming the Young Bucks on top of Adam Cole. Then... Christian gives Adam Cole a concerto, just smashes his head in with a chair on the stage. And I just sat there and I, and I said to myself, Adam Cole literally signed up for this. Imagine if this was, imagine, imagine if he had continued to sign a contract with a certain pal from Stanford. And in his less than two months on the main roster, he had been involved in a comedy sketch, beat up by undercard guys, repeatedly choked out by some underneath guy, and then blasted in the head with a steel chair by a 40-year-old. Anybody who is sitting back saying to themselves that, what is going on in AEW is a good thing. Would be crying rivers of blood if our pal from Stanford had did this same thing to Adam Cole. They will be screaming and pulling their eyeballs off one at a time. They will literally pinch themselves bald in the eyebrows if this was going on on Mondays. I cannot believe They are okay with this. Furthermore, he gets made fun of by Adam fucking Silver, a dude who shouldn't even be on television, is cutting a promo talking about Adam Cole, calling him the budge. I don't even know what the fuck that means. What does that mean? What is the budge? It's John Silver versus the budge. Like, what? Then says that he told Adam Cole to get new gear, change his name, and become the Dark Order's manager. And maybe he wouldn't have got a concerto. Which, of course, is a reference to all the dirt sheets talking about what WWE wanted Adam Cole to do. Which sounds a hell of a lot better than, hey, go get choked out by a five-foot furry midget called the Jungle Boy. Or, hey, come wrestle this other garden gnome called John Silver and put him over for 15 fucking minutes before you beat him. This doesn't make any fucking sense. Why would you do this to this guy? This is what happens to Marks. Adam Cole's a fucking Mark. All right. He put all his eggs in his basket. Now he's wrestling. He can't beat up Jungle Boy. And he's getting beat up by the Dark Order every fucking week. And that's even furthermore, after the fact that he's going to have a match. I, I heard that it was live. 
Two days after a concerto. Two days after a concerto, you get hit in the head with a steel chair. You're back to have a match. But we don't we don't insult people's intelligence. We don't insult people's intelligence at all. It makes perfect sense that you would do that. That, you know, the head and neck damage <laughs> from getting slammed in the head with a chair. Oh yeah, you'll be okay in two days. You'll be perfect. You'll be <laughs> you'll be medically cleared. What kind of doctors do you have? What kind of quack doctors do you have? That's the thing about, you know, modern wrestling. And it began in the attitude era, man. You know, because back in the day, a dude would get, you know, jumped before the match or something like that. And it wouldn't even be that big of a beat down. It'd be like kind of what, what MLW does. Like I talked about MLW having inside the ring durability and outside the ring durability. That's kind of how wrestling was in the 80s. Like if you would have jumped a guy in the ramp in the 80s, the match wouldn't have happened. Even if you just kicked them four times, like, uh, uh, uh. They'd have been like, oh, we're going to throw this match out. There's no way he's going to be able to continue now. You know, perfectly logical. Maybe it's too fragile. But now we got guys getting beat half to death with steel steps and they still have the match. Guy gets hit in the head with a steel chair, gets sandwiched between two steel chairs. He's still going to wrestle. Like, what the fuck? What do you need? The mat trucks to run these guys over? You got to throw these guys out of SpaceX? And they have to fall from the sky like comets in order to stop these guys. What the fuck is going on here? Where's the realism? Where's the where's the emotion and the passion for this stuff? Christian slashing Adam Cole's head with a concerto should have been a bigger deal than it is. Right? It should have been a bigger deal than it was. It felt like just something else that they did to him. Because they did so much shit to him. You know? <laughs> they just did so much shit to these guys. They have slathered Adam Cole in shit since he signed that contract. They have done nothing. They upstaged his debut with Brian Danielson. They immediately slotted him as the third young buck. He didn't get no... He got promo time. But, like, occasionally... And he doesn't really have anything to say when he does talk. He goes through all of the same garbage that the young bucks go through. He's been wrestling underneath guys and nobody of any note. He's not wrestling for any titles. He's not even challenging for any. He's not talking about winning titles. He's not talking about doing anything but hanging out with his fucking friends. This is stupid. This is stupid. And it's frustrating. WWE handed you Adam Cole in the prime of his career. The guy was red fucking hot. Look what you've done. Booker of the year. Booker of the year. And he's a lead pipe lock to win it again. And look what he's done with Adam Cole. Get the fuck out of here. Moving on. Uh, the inner circle did their thing with American Top Team. They picked Junior Dos Santos, Andre Olovsky, Ethan Page, Scorpio Sky, and Dan Lambert. Which, of course, the baby faces would pick the manager to beat up. Um, which means this is basically a handicap match. Uh, okay. Paige Van Zant and Chris Jericho went back and forth. I thought it was funny when she said that, uh, she would take all five of them all at the same time. And then Jericho, of course, added his innuendo to that. I thought that was pretty nice. That was the best thing about this whole bantering back and forth segment. I could care less about Lambert. He, now he feels like he's playing a character on the show. At first, when he first came out and started doing his Jim Cornette thing, it felt organic. It felt it felt good that he was coming out there talking, talking that yin yang. But since he's been a regular, um, he he feeds the crowd stuff to say now, you know, and that's when you just become part of the show. When you are feeding lines to the crowd, like you know, you're feeding the crowd to tell you to shut up. You're feeding the crowd chants. You know, you're feeding the crowd this and feeding the crowd that. It's like, uh, nah, 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 I don't like it. I don't like it. I haven't really felt Dan Lambert in a while anyway. Maybe it's the, it's the, uh, Ethan Page Scorpio Sky thing. Now, their theme song is not bad. I think I finally listened to their theme song today. Um, it's not bad. Um, it's, it's very hip hop ish. Maybe I didn't sit, sit down and listen to it all the way through. 
But from what I heard of it, it wasn't too bad. The American Top Team or Ethan Page Scorpio Sky theme song. It wasn't too bad. But uh, this match is going to suck ass. Um, Andre Olovsky is cool and all. He has a very cool look. Um, well, he did when, I, when he was in the UFC. I don't know if he still does. Um, they brought out a bunch of other guys. I don't know who those guys were. <laughs> so I couldn't tell, couldn't tell you. The match is set. It will be the Inner Circle versus American Top Team. And uh, I'm sure the girls will still be out there to add the, the numbers game for um, American Top Team. But this wasn't very interesting to me. I wasn't really um, impressed by any of the promos, but I did like the Paige Van Zandt and Chris Jericho stuff. That was nice. Because it was a throwback to the Stephanie McMahon stuff. That's the only reason why it was any good. Uh, Matt Seidel congratulated Dante Martin on winning the match against him. He says if he doesn't want to train with him, that's fine. He got Lee Moriarty now. Uh, then he says that he's sure him and Lee Moriarty can beat him and Leo Rush. Can beat Leo Rush and Dante Martin. Um, they accepted the challenge and the match will still happen. Um, poor Lee Moriarty. <laughs> poor Lee Moriarty. I guess if you, whatever. You know, AEW doesn't care about this shit. You know, they're trying their best to make this Leo Rush Dante Martin thing happen. I don't know why, but I'm guessing it leads, it leads up to the return of Darius Martin. Uh, Jamie Hayter defeated Anna J in the first round of the TBS tournament. Um, Tay Conti had to save Anna J from Jamie and Britt Baker and all of them who were beating her up after the match. Thunder Rosa came out there to help too. So, of course, it's going to be, end up being like a six woman tag. Okay. Sure. Whatever. Um, at some point during this episode, Sheeta got her award for winning 50 matches and got accosted by Nyla Rose, who does not have 50 wins and was somehow making fun of how long it took for Sheeta to win 50 matches. Uh, I, I didn't get that. It was stupid. <laughs> it, was, it was stupid. I like Sheeta, man. I, I really do. They just, they just have her looking like a goof all the time. And this is sad. Um, Jade Cargill cut a promo talking about why she got a buy from the tournament because of her unblemished record. But then said she would face the winner of the bunny and red velvet. And I'll say, oh, fuck you. She's just going to wrestle red velvet again. So she's going to win the tournament by beating somebody she's beaten three times already. How many times is she going to beat red velvet? Are you serious? How many times is she actually going to have to beat red velvet? Is she going to ever wrestle anybody else? <sighs> Where's Layla Hirsch? So, um, any event. Jay Cargill is a flash in the pan. She's going to win the tournament. MJF had himself a promo here on this show. Then he came in and laid out all in the line. And um, there was parts of this promo that I liked and the parts that I didn't like. So, let's get to the parts that I liked. Uh, MJF came, says that when all the new faces came into AEW, all the boys in the back were sweating bullets. But not them. They're pillars. We have the it factor, and we had it long before Dynamite came. And I, I thought that was okay. Uh, they they really lean in kind of heavy into this pillars lore. I'm like, okay, um, these guys kind of made this stuff up, and now they're just going to run with it. Uh, that's fine. That, you know, they were guys who weren't really worried about their spot. When Punk and Danielson and Cole and Miro and Andrade and Malachi Black and all these guys came in. They weren't really concerned with their spot. Because they were the Golden Boys. And I like that. that you know, that it will be a good explanation to why they weren't that concerned. They were guys with the it factor. You know, they were the Golden Boys. They don't have nothing to worry about. Um, I would have liked for them to maybe turn that a little bit. As maybe J MJF himself was the Golden Boy. And that everybody else had to prove themselves, like Sammy Guevara and all those guys. And the other two, you know, which was Sammy and Jungle Boy. They had to prove themselves. But MJF, you know, he got glad-handed in. He was protected by Chris Jericho and, and hand-picked by all these other guys and stuff like that. I think they would have should have leaned more into that. Maybe making MJF seem like he was um, more protected than the others. That's why he's the only one that's undefeated and all that kind of stuff. Um, but from there, he starts talking about how it used to bother him that the fans cheered Darby over him. I'm like, why would MJF care about that? What what about the MJF character shows me that he cares about other people being cheered more than him? 
I don't know. Then he gets into a generic promo about, you know, I am everything that they, the fans can never be. You're just like them. That's generic as fuck. You know, that's a, that's, that's super generic. I could have swear I heard that promo a hundred times already. I represent the people that they, that made fun of them. I was the, the jock in high school that stole the girl that you were trying to bang. You, you're the guy that was in soccer club and chess club and the AV club. You're the outsider. You're the weirdo. You're the guy who used to push in the lockers, man. You're the guy who used to give noogies to. And it's like, uh, I'm tired of hearing about how much Darby Allen is, in, is on the outskirts. It's like there's too many Darby Allens running around here. They're not all outsiders. Come on. They got, they got an entire store to themselves. It's called Hot Topic. And they also got Spencer's Gifts where they go buy their dildos and stuff. These guys aren't too much on the outskirts of anything. You know, come on, let's, let's get it. Let's get it together here. But it's, a, I guess you have to play this card because that's the only thing Darby Allen really has is that he's an outsider and he's different. But you should have, I don't know, maybe make something up. Go back to his dead uncle or something. You know, or if this would have been the finals of the tournament, um, it would have been a, a, a dope angle to play. Um, imagine for a moment if MJF and Darby Allen was the main event for the world title eliminator tournament and the winner was going to wrestle the world champion. All this stuff about them being the pillars would have made perfect sense in this, in this context, because it would have been which one of the pillars is going to be the first one to win the world title, you know, and it would have been a dog race where it would have been like MJF was, had already gotten a shot before. And he fell short, but now he's back in the running. And Darby is a guy who never got a shot before. And this could be his first shot. And he really, really wants it. And MJF is going to do whatever he can to keep it away from Darby Allen. You know, to prove that he is the the top pillar of AEW. It still wouldn't have made any sense for them to lean so heavily on the pillar lore. But at least in that context of them being the guys in the tournament, it would have been there can be only one because there can only be one winner. In this context, who cares who wins? Because you don't get anything. So, <laughs> so it doesn't matter. You get bragging rights. You know, that that's something, I guess, but not really. So I don't know. I don't know what the purpose of this was. And I don't see why we blowing off any of the heat by MJF giving Darby so much credit and talking about how, you know, how great Darby is and all that kind of stuff. I get that he wants to get him over so he can beat him. That's promo one on one. But that hasn't been MJF promos. You know, that's inconsistent with his character. MJF is a burial machine. You know, that's what he does. He tries to bury his opponents if he can. He doesn't give guys credit so that when he beats them, he looks better in in doing so. He beats you and then told you, and it's, I, I told you so. Oh, yeah, I beat this guy, but I told you I was going to do that. So are you really surprised? You know, as opposed to, you know, you're one of the best, but I am so much better than you. And I am a better wrestler than you, Darby. And I cut better promos than you, Darby. And there used to be guys who can cut a lot of good promos, but they couldn't wrestle, Darby. But I can do both. I'm like, who cares about any of this shit? Darby's sitting up there stewing. Because he, you know, you beat him up in the, in the parking lot. Like, we didn't forget that. So now we're talking about, I can beat you with a headlock takeover. Like, um, okay, sure, whatever. I, I don't know. I think we're off the mark here a little bit when it comes to this Darby MJF thing. And maybe I'm not putting it in an appropriate way because I'm kind of tired. But I don't see how MJF's character is is uh, consistent in this regard. Like, Why does he give a shit that the crowd likes Darby Allin? Why does he give a shit that he's a better wrestler than Darby Allin? I'm better than you and you know it can mean anything. And it changes in terms of context. As the character can play, I'm better than you in terms of wrestling. I'm better than you in terms of promo. I'm better than you in terms of being a better person than you. A better man than you. A better uh, anything than you. You can change the context 
and it, with that whenever you want. And he's going to say that anyway. So it doesn't matter what that I'm better than you at blank. It doesn't matter what that is. He's going to say I'm better than you and you know it regardless. So the idea that we're going to simply beat the drum of he's a better wrestler seems really silly to me. I don't know. I don't know why that. And then all the little stings and all that kind of stuff. I thought that was silly too. This feud seems to have lost its way. And, uh, cause it's a few for nothing, you know, uh, Tony Khan didn't, he didn't want to put these two guys in the tournament and I feel like he probably should have, and this probably should have been the main event of the tournament should have been Darby and MJF. That way you can have a personal feud. Like I get it. You want to have personal feuds that don't have anything to do with the title, but I think that a few between the two guys that you have pegged as the future of AEW, it should be over the title. You know, that should be the main focus of their feud. And then maybe Hangman Page as the new world champion, hopefully, will call himself a pillar. Like, why can't I be a pillar? You know, I'm not much older than you guys. You know, I, I was relatively unknown. Why can't I be a pillar? Why does it got to be you guys? Why can't it be me too? You know? And I think that would be a nice little addition there, especially for people who are, you know, watching AEW for the established guys. You know, Heyman Page should be put on that same level as a guy that, you know, was untested, unreally, un, unknown, really, outside of the, you had to really be into the Ring of Honor to even know who Heyman Page was, really. Because um, the name Adam Page wasn't exactly ringing bells everywhere across the globe until he got to AEW. So I think it would have been safe for him to be to be one of the four pillars, be a guy that, you know, AEW was meant to be built around and for you to add him to that class. And I think if you do that and create that lore of those five core characters, you know, Jungle Boy, Darby, MJF, uh, Sammy Guevara and Adam Page, and then we maybe once or twice a year, these guys bang heads against each other. You know, in order to establish who's going to be the guy, you know, Sammy Guevara was the first one that to win a title. Uh, but, you know, Heyman may be the first one to win the world title, you know. So that could be, you know, different, a, a different lore that you can build stories out of. But I think you have to put, you know, they kind of killed the whole Hangman thing by putting him in the elite. Because now he's in a class of, you know, he should have been, he was with these guys. And it's like, no, he should never should have been in the elite. He's not elite. Nobody knows who the fuck this guy was until AEW happened. You know, so it was kind of a mistake. But uh, this should have been in the context of the tournament. This whole MJF Darby Allen thing. It should have been in the tournament. And uh, you, can't, you can't really get me to, <laughs> to believe different on that tip. Um, now, of course you say, well, what was Danielson going to do? I don't know. Shit. Dang, I'm not the booker, but I definitely think that, uh, you know, putting Danielson in, in a match against, I'm going to guess world champion hangman page and then having hangman page beat him is absolute shit. It's the shits. Um, I don't think Brian would even want to go over hangman page in that, t in that context. And the crazy thing is if you beat hangman, you kill him. Because, you know, you pretty much promised your entire fan base he was going to win the title. So I think he has to win. If he doesn't win, he's dead. And if he does win and then he beats Brian, you're going to turn off a lot of people. Because a lot of folks are going to be like, fuck you. I'm not going to sit here and watch this. It was kind of like when uh, Cena beat Jericho that time. There's a lot of people who are like, what? Fuck you. Or, or or when he beat Kurt Angle. Um, not the time to get the title shot, but <clears throat> when he was the champ, I think it was Unforgiven. And Kurt Angle just couldn't beat John Cena. You know, it's like, come on. We know John, Kurt Angle could beat John Cena, but he's just not beating him. It was bullshit. You know, it's kind of it's kind of the same thing here. Where if Hangman Page all of a sudden beaten, uh, <laughs> beats Danielson and Punk, and Moxley and Kingston. And you're like, oh, get the fuck out of here. Because he wasn't wrestling these guys to get to this point. Now all of a sudden. And that's another reason that's wrong with AEW's booking strategy. 
is that they don't give guys like really, really, really tough tests to get them on that level. Like Heyman Page should have to have beaten CM Punk or Eddie Kingston or somebody like that to get this title shot. He won a ladder match to get the title shot. You know, that's okay. That's good. You know, but I'm I'm in the old school camp. You know, I think the money in the bank kind of cheapened things. So that's why I think it's a heel uh, concept. You know, the you win a ladder match. It's like what happened to the old school grit? You know, you had to fight through top contenders. You had to beat top guys in hard fought matches to be considered a top guy in your own right. And then you you become solidified as a top guy having gone through top guys to get that spot. Like I remember when, you know, I know this video going a little long, but I remember when Jeff Hardy was moving to the main event, you know, in 2008. And they gave Jeff Hardy victories over Undertaker and Shawn Michaels. And I was like, what the fuck is going on? I remember watching that stuff. And I was like, Jeff Hardy just beat Shawn Michaels. What the fuck? You know? And then he beat the Undertaker. I was like, what the fuck? Are you serious? And I was like, well, he's probably about to be the world champion. And then sure enough, he was. (laughs) Sure enough, he was. And he wasn't champion long. He was champion for like three weeks. They took the belt from him. But um, that wasn't the point. The point was when they were ready to take him to the next level, they put him in a series of matches. For instance, they had started a year before when he was wrestling Randy Orton at the Royal Rumble. He had like, I think he was just fresh off of the Intercontinental title or he was the Intercontinental champion, one of the two. And he was pushing Randy to the limit. And I was like, oh, this is looking pretty good. That's, you know, that slow, gradual build. That's what you should want for your baby face. It's not, you know, hot shotting the guy to the top with the use of a, a poker chip or a money in the bank thing. So I, I think Big E is kind of took a hit when it comes to that. I think there's some there's something missing with that grit. You know, like what Edge talked about, that passion, where people can see the struggle. Big E talked about this, where he says, like, you know, everybody saw the journey. Everybody watched the journey. They're invested in the journey. I still think they cheated with the money in the bank thing. But when people are invested in the journey, you really get over because the journey is in the chase. That's the thing that the money in the bank and the poker chip thing has fucked over. People forgot that the money is always in the chase, not in the sudden cash in shock moment. No, it's in the fucking chase. It is in you getting close, failing, getting back up and chasing all over again. That's what it's in, all right? Hey, man, Page should have lost his title shot, been like, fuck it, I'm going to start from scratch. You know, no more drinking, no more hanging out with the bum-ass Dark Order. I'm getting in this title tournament eliminator, and I'm going to beat every motherfucker in it. And then he wins the fucking tournament, and then wins the fucking fucking title. That would have been so much better than, oh, I came back from paternity leave, I got a poker chip, I'm the champion now. Because everybody knows he's going to fucking win. So it's like, uh, this is, how earned did it really feel? Sure, he had that massive setback, but now he was skyrocketed back to his position before. This is bullshit. Everybody respects the grind. Everybody respects the grind. Give people the fucking grind, man. That's what this stuff is missing. They're missing the grind. Bring back the grind. I'm not about banning the money in the bank and all that kind of stuff. I know some people are. But we need to bring back the grind. That's why Kofi got over. Kofi hit the grind. It was a little bit different because it had all those gauntlets and stuff like that. But people saw the grind. People saw Kofi in the ring with AJ Styles and Daniel Bryan and him trying to beat these dudes who are, you know, solidified main event top guys. And Kofi is... You know, trying to get on that level. That's what Kofi Mania was all about. That's why it worked. It worked because people respect the grind. You got to respect the grind, man. AEW didn't do that. They made a mistake. You had so many different choices over what you could have done with this tournament. Knowing that you were going to do the tournament. You could have had Danielson, Omega, and did that match at Full Gear. The rematch of the match at Arthur Ashe. Did the rematch. No disqualifications. No countouts. Or just no countouts. 
put Omega over. And then the same night, you have Heyman beat somebody major in that tournament. Uh, Punk, Moxley, uh, MJF, uh, Darby, somebody. A top guy. An undeniable top guy. And, and Hangman beat him. And now Hangman is back. He's more focused than ever. And Kenny Omega is at the height of his power because he beat who everybody thinks is the best wrestler in the world. You set it up for a big episode of Dynamite and you have Hangman beat Kenny Omega for the belt on TV. Instead of paying for on a pay-per-view, you beat him on TV. And I think that would have been a better way to do it. People would have respected the grind. Not respecting the grind right now. That's trash. And it's, it shows. You know, there's that's what goes doubles back to what I was talking about with Kenny Omega being a lame duck champion. You know, this tournament is kind of lame duck too. Not just because Moxie, you know, had to go to rehab and he's out. No, it's like we all knew when we looked at the bracket who was winning the tournament, right? S- say I'm lying. Look, at, you look at the bracket and say, oh, Danielson's winning this tournament. Say I'm lying. No, Moxley's not going to win it. Kingston's not going to win it. Lance Archer, for heaven's sake, he's not going to win it. Orange Cassidy's not going to win it. So who the fuck going to win? Danielson. If you'd have put somebody else in there, put some more sharks in there. That's why you can't be scared of having people lose. I get, that's why you can't be scared of having people lose, man. It, people respect the grind. You can. It's okay to lose. Benoit. What made WrestleMania 20 so special? It's because people saw that Benoit kept getting so close. They they saw him on SmackDown almost beat Brock Lesnar. He was so close. He almost beat Kurt Angle. He was so close. And then he finally did it at WrestleMania 20. The grind. That's what it is. That's where the money at. AEW decided to hot shot and fuck everything up. But then again, I ain't the booker of the year. All right, I'm about to go to bed. Uh, Like this video, share this video, subscribe to the channel. Donate to the channel. Thank you guys for your time. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. And I'll talk to you guys later.